Chris Bache said this recently, and I think about it in a different way too, which is like, um, you know, that the, the manner of inquiry, that, that, that this is a Jenkins thing, a Bache thing, something else like the manner of inquiry is as important as what you're inquiring about. Um, right. And so I hope that, you know, on the underside of this is a conversation where you and I kind of disagreed and agreed, you know, and conflicted, but ultimately it stayed mutually respectful and positive and, and was like a Daniel, um, uh, Schmack, Schmackenberger says, you know, like being in a pro opponent processing without becoming adversaries. Um, and yeah, so hopefully that's, there's something of that there too. Man, that's the nature of ecology. You know, if all the, if all the trees grew in the same way, uh, you wouldn't have a robust system, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, I'm delighted when people disagree with me. I don't like being censored, no. but you know, I don't, I mean, I disagree with myself three times a day, I mean, like, maybe, <laughs> maybe six times a day, you know, I'm, yeah. I, actually Gandhi said, um, Gandhi said that, um, what did he say, uh, consistency, he had a quote about consistency being like, um, being just a really bad thing, like, a uh, something which is, uh, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't try to be consistent. Why, why, why should we try and be consistent? Then you end up defending some stupid argument when you've already realized that it's actually probably oh, no man not at all i think you're very candid uh, very straightforward and you know very easy to talk to as you as you always are Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This podcast explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research. As you can tell, probably from the ambient sound, if you're watching this on YouTube and if, or sorry, if you're listening to this, and if you're watching it on YouTube, the forest behind me, I am not in my office. I'm not in the studio. Um, I'm actually in on the great uh, Northern Peninsula of Newfoundland off the East coast of Canada, <clears throat> which is where I'm recording this. Uh, and yes, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, today's interview is a complex one and a bit of a charged one. We're going to be talking with Danny Nemu and we're going to be talking about the failures of science as an institution for truth. And uh, so right off the bat, <laughs> a number of you are probably going, whoa, what? Uh, well, let's add to that complexity. We're also going to talk about um, the role of human-centric ideology in the perpetuation of ecological devastation. And uh, we're going to talk a whole lot about COVID and uh, essentially the differing narratives of COVID and some of the sort of... Uh, criticism and uh, criticisms and skepticism around the prevailing narrative for COVID-19 and the pandemic response. Um, so as you can imagine, it's a, it's a bit of a charged episode, um, charged for myself as well. You probably heard in the pre-intro there, me talking about my own reactivity, my own ideological assumptions uh, being revealed as a consequence of being confronted uh, with, uh, with content and information that uh, was affronting to me. <clears throat> um, but as you also heard in the pre-entry, there was managed well between Danny and I, which I think pr produced a pretty uh, positive, uh, positive episode. So who is Danny Nemu? Danny Nemu is a hypnotherapist, activist, and author with an academic background in the history of medicine and 20 years experience in the Daimi Ayahuasca community including an eight-month cure in the Amazon battling a flesh-eating parasite. His fundamental interest in how humans break free of their, quote, mind-forged manacles, end quote, and his research focuses on drugs in the Bible, revelation, and real politic and science, and the connection between linguistics, neurobiology, and cognition. He writes for Cypress UK, the Journal of Psychedelic Studies, and Lucid News. He has given talks at Breaking Convention and on biblical entheogens and neocolonialism in ayahuasca studies, 
and is a regular guest on podcasts including Rune Soup and Aeon Bite. His books Science Revealed and Neural Apocalypse are out on Cypress UK. Articles, talks, and podcasts are collected on his website, and his inconsistent opinions are to be taken with a pinch of salt on Twitter, his words. Uh, links to all of that will be in the show notes to this episode. Danny has previously been on the show for an episode about drugs in the Bible, and uh, he's on the show to talk about his book, Science Revealed, today, which was released a couple of years ago. And uh, the interview ended up being less so about the book in particular and more so about the topic the book covers, which is um, sort of criticisms against the scientific institution as a beacon of truth in society, uh, as it is being expressed presently in the context of co the COVID-19 pandemic and um, basically the ecological crisis. Now, Danny and I contrast on a number of things here, or in the sense there are moments of conflict between us uh, in the midst of the conversation, all of which held well, uh, which is which was positive. There are places of agreement, places of difference, and places of conflict. Uh, and I haven't released this yet, mostly because of just wanting to curate the content, up, you know, at the right time. Uh, but also because I have been reluctant to release anything that sort of like talks too much about COVID right now because of how complex and, in all honesty, I think really dysfunctional the the narrative around uh the the narratives and the the larger discourse around COVID-19 is going in our society on on every level um so with that being said if you'll bear with me I want to talk a little bit about uh I want to talk in this intro about something in particular um so the intro is going to be a bit longer you can skip ahead timestamps are on YouTube what I want to talk about is that um Looking back at Eric Davis, uh, an interview I did with him a couple of years ago, he talked about the liquefying of reality, wherein previously we had a mainstream narrative, we had a main narrative, and generally it was either the main narrative or against that name, main narrative. That was sort of how reality was made sense of, for better or worse. And now that main narrative has been, for the most part, dissolved away due to the slow and, I think, reasonable dismantling of the centralized authorities uh, of news media and the proliferation of social media sort of tangent <laughs> tangent or like alternative uh, worldviews and narratives about what's happening, creating sort of a, a, a very unstable ground for making sense of what's real. The, the, the previous authorities by which we would proxy our sense making on issues that were complex enough that we were not able to you know properly understand them in our regular lives, that those authorities are sort of dissolving away. And, um, and reality is liquefying as a consequence, at least uh, in some sense, according to uh, Eric Davis. And um, mixing that in with, so, so, so that said, it's hard to tell what's true anymore, um, apart from maybe very localized sense of experience um, and some major things. Uh, but what is certainly true is that we are all being confronted with and are in the midst of what Daniel Schmachterberger calls multi-level narrative warfare, where our embodied emotional energy is uh, being manipulated to have us allegiance ourselves, allegiance that embodied emotional energy towards particular worldview and as a consequence, particular choices. Um, and we are all subject to that. And in the midst of that, it's really hard to make sense uh, of what's going on. Every bit of information we experience on the internet, if it's, you know, <laughs> where it's the news, regardless of where we're getting it, is manipulating information by manipulating what is being spoken about and how it's being spoken about, what the content being reported on is and the narrative around that content in order to produce a particular worldview. And some of that is positive, some of that is benign, and some of that is negative. Some of it is self-aware manipulation, and some of it is just you know, automatons marching to the beat of their own ideology in the midst of and in the face of, you know, the distorted human circus facing its own, you know, like globalized civilization collapsing before its own eyes. Um, and so that makes making sense of things really difficult. Uh, and add to that the impact of social media on our 
inability to have differences of opinion without launching into reactivity, ideology, bonding through bullying and conf- uh, conflating um, conflict with abuse. And, you know, we have, and I've, I've given a video about this about um, social media's effect on how we interact with each other, uh, a response to the social dilemma. I'll link to it here. Um, but yeah, so given all of that, it's really hard to have discussions about things that are polarizing, like COVID-19 and like the value of science. Um, uh, and that's what Danny and I are going to do today. And um, I hope that the manner of inquiry by which we engage this complex and conflicting discussion between him and I is itself a, a, a line of information to learn and engage and to discuss as much as the content of what we are inquiring about is present. And so with that, um, and before we get into the episode, you know, I invite you to hold a grain of salt for, you know, both his opinion and my opinion. And also to keep in mind that this interview was recorded several months ago. Um, And again, I've been hesitant because it doesn't matter whether or not I'm towing the party line, the mainstream narrative party line or not. Uh, You know, you you just can't get it right on the internet if you talk about anything all too conflicting. So I've, and I've, I've been wondering about whether or not it's responsible um, in the context of people taking whatever information they can and confirmation biasing themselves into an anti-narrative um, whether or not it was responsible to re- release this episode. But here we are. It's happening. Um, but yeah, this was several months ago. So there might be a number of things that were talked about that have since been, you know, new information has since sort of affirmed or um, debunked some of the things that are being said or discussed here. So essentially listen with a grain of salt and, um, you know, don't proxy your sense making around this to either Danny or I, but to do your own thorough investigations, fact checking, source checking. Um, you know, and like soul check-in about, uh, about what's real and what really matters in the midst of all of this. So, okay. So that's the very long preamble. Thank you very much for listening to that. Um, big thank you to my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube. Um, they give significantly and this podcast would not exist without my patrons. So thank you. If you are not yet a patron, you'd like to become one, head to patreon.com forward slash jams Gesso become a regular financial contributor to the show, or you can leave a one-time PayPal or crypto donation. Links are in the description to this podcast, wherever you're checking it out. Uh, So thank you very much for doing that. Of course, word of mouth shares, um, word of mouth distribution is also a very supportive act if you're enjoying this episode. So Okay, that's it. That's the preamble. That's the introduction. Uh, Please enjoy this interview with Danny Nemu on Adventures to the Mind, episode 146, exploring the uh, exploring some criticisms of the scientific institution as a reliable um, foundation for what is true, or something like that. <laughs> okay, here we go. In- okay, Danny Nemu, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. Hey, Jay, go. Oh, good, except... You are completely lagging on that response, and half of it wasn't heard. <laughs> oh, man. How about that? How about my uh, expression of dissatisfaction? Did that come through? The dissatisfaction came in perfectly clear, very coherent. <laughs> okay. Well, we're setting the tone then. It's all good. Okay. okay. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, okay. Let's, uh, well, welcome back, Danny Nemo, <laughs> to Adventures Through the Mind. <laughs> Good to be here. Oh, clear, clear as clear as mud. Uh, no, actually, very, very clear. I'm actually kind of peaking here, so I want to bring it down a bit. Um, yes, hello, welcome back. So it's been a sort of a long process of getting you back on the show, not because of any one thing in particular, it just hasn't really worked out till about now. And initially, I wanted to have you on the show to talk about your book from a few years back, Science Revealed, uh, which I found to be a sort of poet, very poetic, um, which is maybe a simplified way of saying it was pretty <laughs> or a nice way of saying it was very pretty to read, but also very thought provoking. You. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Uh, very thought provoking and, uh, and led me with a lot of curiosity around sort of questioning uh, or wondering about, you know, sort of the degree of, of, um, of authority on what's what that I proxy out to academic institutions and in particular, um, the institution of peer revert, excuse me, peer reviewed 
journals. Um, and especially since I read it, I think early on in the pandemic, it was interesting to to be to be wondering about those things in a context where, you know, there's a lot of questioning of the validity of science and scientific institutions, a lot of which maybe not so not so intellectually or philosophically uh, substantial. Um, so, and, and of course, like the cultural and perhaps even public health consequences of that type of questioning. So it was a really nuanced, complex thing. Fast forward several months and here we are to talk about it. Um, so you had actually sent me some questions. You're like, here, let's explore these things. And I was, I'm like, yeah, great. Um, but before, before I ask you some of the, the questions that you, you threw out in my way, I, I want to give you a space to respond to what I, what I just said there. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting, been an interesting pandemic, you know, everyone's an epidemiologist. Uh, everyone's suddenly got opinions on immunity. Um, and, uh, everyone's flinging data at each other. <clears throat> um, I don't know what it's like there, but we have COVID news all the time, like mm-hmm. all the time, all channels, um, you can't video without being told fear inducing things. Um, there's signs up on the, by the road. <clears throat> um, it's full on. It's, it's the, it's the kind of mental informational space we're in at the moment. And actually in England, we had two years of Brexit and it was like all, all the time. It was Brexit in the news all the time. And now we've got COVID in the news all the time. <clears throat> and, um, so I think that's very interesting. Um, I've kind of been, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm quite apocalyptic by nature. I have been for a long time. Uh, I've always been, um, I've, I've now got, I've got two kids who are 12 years old and I can't imagine what the world's going to be like when they're 18. Right. And <clears throat> a lot of people are kind of thinking the same way as I was 20 years ago. Now, when you see things like the, what was it? I saw the other day, uh, in the U S I think there's, 22% of the printed since, was it 1776 were printed in the last 12 months? Well, that's large, you know, and we've got a similar situation here in Europe. So suddenly everything's uh, very, very strange, right? Very, very strange. I think that's interesting. I like, I'm delighted that the authorities of science are collapsing. Um, I think that's um, high time that it happened. Uh, <clears throat> the institution of peer review I mean, it just says it in the word, doesn't it? It's peer review. So what about the rest of us who aren't your peers? What do we have to say about it? You know, what do, what do indigenous voices have to say in your peer review process? Uh, what do um, voices from the global south, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I think that's interesting. I, th- I will touch on one thing that you said. Um, this reaction against authority, and that's, you know, we've had a reaction against political authority for quite a long time. That's it's fairly normal, you know, in uh, subcultures to be to question uh, political authority, religious authority, etc. And we've often done that by saying, "Here, look at the science." You know, mm-hmm. uh, we've been trying to legalize cannabis for forty years. Look at the science. Look at the science. Um, <clears throat> it didn't work. Uh, if cannabis is moving towards um, any kind of um, public, uh, if cannabis is becoming more liberalized, then it's not because of any science. It's not because of any data that came out. The data has been there for forever, right? Uh, what happened in England anyway, we had a, um, a very sick kid who was having epileptic fits every day. And his mum went to, I think actually went to Canada and brought back some cannabis oil. Billy, Billy Childwell, his name is, and the mother is, uh, What's her name now? I forgot what her name is. But anyway, this woman <clears throat> with a very beautiful story, a very sad story, and a very clear uh, story of the impact of cannabis on this kid's good health. That was what was what pushed the, the the story in this country, right? Um, take another example. We've had if you if you follow the the science on global warming, on sea level rising, uh, <clears throat> on uh, ecosystem destruction, all that kind of stuff. We've had that science since I was, uh, well, since the 80s, you know, global warming. The greenhouse effect's been known about since then. And it's been pretty difficult to dispute for a long time, but policy hasn't changed, right? So if your authorities can't author reality, you know, to use the kind of <clears throat> going to the etymology of it, 
what, what are they doing? You know, what's, what's the point of having, uh, of having, <clears throat> putting our faith in that? It doesn't seem to do anything, right? We might feel like we have the right idea and then we can feel more superior uh, to other people who are superstitious. And um, so that's one thing, you know, scientific authority, <clears throat> science hasn't really helped us out, I don't think. Well, hold on, hold on. I feel like uh, I feel um, like I want to push back on you here a little bit, Danny, because I, I there's a part of me, I, I'm going to have to try to manage the part that's a reasonable argument and the part of me that's kind of reactive and the part of me that agrees <laughs> all at once, um, which is, you know, I, I can I can see how the sort of the 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 dominance of the western industrial complex and its conquest colonial conquest historically but also still a type of colonial conquest over the cultural commons of a lot of the rest of the world you know led by you know the institutions of science as the reference point for when it you know is convenient to push forward on things and that science often being sort of convoluted by for profit models in academia and industry and ideology sort of distorting what gets scientifically validated for for those things as being troublesome right and 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 problematic from like a you know what is what is the best way to collaboratively live on this planet as a, as a as a species of of many different variations culturally and otherwise right so i see that on on another end it sounds like you're saying like yeah there's no value whatsoever to anything that science has brought forth. You know, I, I see what you're saying about the the cannabis argument that it wasn't until there was a relatable story in the culture that for people to lobby for culturally to push for policy change because, you know, if policy if it isn't convenient to the powers that be, policy is not going to change. Right. And so I get that. And at the same time, I think it's sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater to say that all the scientific and medical arguments that were established for the last 50 years played no role whatsoever in the shifting of policy or the shifting of public opinion. You know, even though the public might not be informed of the science and the science might not have led to policy changes, although it has in different places through medicalization in, in the United States, for example. Um, and in Canada, I mean, like the justification for recreational and medical use of cannabis was very much founded on there being scientific evidence, although it was a cultural push that that brought us there. Right. I guess my pushback is like, it sounds as though you're saying like, there's basically no value to anything that science has has brought forth science as like a, the institutions that arise out of scientific investigation and, and, the, and the scientific sort of um, method. Right. Um, and so then what do we just like tear it all down and it's just like a free for all of, of sort of like, re like <laughs> relative knowledge, like everyone's sort of beliefs without verification or authority. Like, I mean, I, I could be like some sort of lost on my own side of this here too, but I'm kind of throwing it out. Cause I feel like, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, good. Yeah. Uh, excellent. So we've had 50 years of justification from the scientific community. We've had several uh, millennia of experience from people using cannabis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You go back to um, Islamic medieval um, commentators saying, well, if you add um, this thing, oh, you're drinking mate. No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you add this particular um, uh, mixture into uh into the mix, then you won't, you won't have the, uh, you won't feel groggy in the morning, right? That wasn't a scientific uh, investigation or, or it was actually a scientific investigation, but it's not this kind of, it's not the institutions of science that produced it. Right. Um, I don't, I don't need, um, justification from the institutions to that. I, I don't need justification from institutions other institutions to tell me whether I can smoke a joint or not. Mm -hmm. Like, well, actually, I do because mm -hmm. we're in a prison of authority, right? Right, right. Um, and such, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> I guess I'd, that's one thing I'd say. The other thing is, um, and it comes back to what gets published, what gets um, the the process of publication, right? Uh, and we're going right into the deep end, right at the beginning of our talk, <clears throat> but. If you take the current pandemic situation, for example, right, you might have heard a lot of talk about vitamin D, 
Yeah, in fact, there was a particular paper. Um, I'm a little, it was uh, an Indonesian paper from a hospital. And I might be a little bit fuzzy on the details here because I haven't really looked for a little while. Um, but there was a hospital analysis of people who, uh, who died from COVID-related complications. Yeah. And uh, they were all standardized to their levels of DMT. I was about to say levels of DMT. That was the last <laughs> conversation we had. The levels of vitamin D <laughs> yeah. in, their, uh, in, their, uh, in their system, right? And the, the, the results are basically, uh, it was something, I can't remember these exact figures, it was 4 or 6% of the deaths had normal vitamin D levels, right? Uh, and 94 or 96% of the deaths had uh, lower um, vitamin D levels. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Um, it's so interesting that it was the most downloaded paper uh, on, I think it was PubMed that month, <clears throat> and then it was pulled, right? The, the paper was pulled off the internet. Uh, and there was a, um, pub, uh, a kind of uh, uh, an explanation for why it was pulled, and it said there's no indication that these figures are representative, right? Interesting, very, very scientific uh, response, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have, I believe it was a, a, a study of around 500 people. It was in that order. Um, and there were people in a hospital, but you've got some scientific authority saying there's no, there's no, um, there's no indication that these are representative. Uh, that's fair enough. You could say there's no indication these are representative and leave the thing there. That's what happens in science. In fact, that's what peer review is. Peers come in and they review it, you know, and they say, well, this bit's missing. They don't hide it. They don't censor it, right? You also have Europe-wide studies saying similar things about vitamin D. Mm -hmm. You've also got... Um, there's there's another a lot of paper good evidence there. for it now, yeah. yeah. There's evidence for vitamin D altering outcomes in every single uh, admission course for hospitals. So basically, if you go to a hospital and you've had a car crash, or you've got flu, or you've got a broken arm, or whatever it is, if you have vitamin D levels that are normal, uh, you're much like more likely to uh, have a positive result, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is what I mean. Um, w we have a massive global response to a pandemic, yeah, and it involves producing all kinds of, um, let's not go down there, it involves a very specific way of treating a disease, um, actually not treating a disease, trying to prevent a disease, because... Mm -hmm. There's um, kind of central directives saying that, uh, that there's no way of treating, um, actually just in England for the over 50s, I think, that one uh, treatment has now been approved after, what are we talking about, a year and a half or something? You know, when I got COVID, um, I treated it with garlic and onions and um what else? A whole bunch of herbs. My, my mum, my parents are old, you know, uh, 79 and 77, right? They, they were treating it with antivirals. My mum's an acupuncturist and she was using Chinese antivirals. And here's an interesting thing. They got it from a GlaxoSmithKline doctor who came to dinner at their house. And he'd spent a whole bunch of years kind of taking the piss out of my mum for her weird medical uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, he left his wife at home because he had flu symptoms and then there's maybe seven, there's maybe eight, but seven old people got together for dinner. Uh, he was a friend of the family. Um, uh, I say was because he died on a ventilator, um, a week later, the mm -hmm. ventilators, you might've seen the figures there as well. I think you've, I don't know what, that, I don't know what the figures in different countries are, but you know, you've got like a, about a one in 10 chance of getting off a ventilator if you go on, on a ventilator, you know, but there's this massive drive towards ventilators, right? So we've got all these, very technological, very hyper-scientific treatments that have been brought in, right? But then when someone like Evo Morales, for example, says the way to treat this is with ginger and lemon and honey, right? He's ridiculed, you know, and he's considered a, uh, uh, a menace to society for this kind of thing, right? Um, so that's where it's been published and then was taken off the internet. So we're kind of used to that. You might see on Twitter, Facebook, all these kind of places are censoring YouTube as well, censoring all kinds of um, what we might say less intellectual um, conspiracy theories. Um, <clears throat> but the censorship begins earlier than that. It begins right when somebody decides they want to study something. If a scientist wants to study something, they have to see if, they're, uh, if they don't have a great deal of authority already because they haven't established themselves in the academy. 
then they have to uh, study something which they know isn't going to uh, rub anyone up the wrong way, right? Mm -hmm. if, they publish, if they try and publish it, then <clears throat> it has to go through um, the journal or the authorities in the journal as well. And most areas, they're fine. Don't get me wrong. There's not like some massive overarching control over most of science. If you study uh, um, the nervous system of uh, a, um, I don't know, a horse or something, uh, no one's going to interfere your research but there are some where your, your research is going to be interfered with and that's what part of my book is about one of the one of the stories in the book is about a gentleman by the name of Jacques Benveniste who was a, uh, <clears throat> a French immunologist and he started looking at unauthorized cures basically um, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later um, but there are certain areas and one of them is um, medicine which is not the or the authorized forms of medicine uh, which you will have a great deal of difficulty in publishing. Yeah, and that's as an academic. Mm -hmm. And then there's something else I want to say as well. Um, when science looks at something, it looks at something in a very specific way, and you generally have a, uh, a system, and then you alter one aspect of the system. Yeah, so for example, if you want to see, I remember going back all the way to school, we grew some plants and we put some of them in the dark. We have to make sure we put them in the dark, but we didn't put them out, you know, and we make sure we put them in the dark, but we didn't change the amount of water we gave them. So you control, that's why it's called a control, you control for one aspect of the whole system, right? So when I was sick in the jungle, in the Amazon, uh, I was drinking uh, daimi, ayahuasca, for a disease which is not really meant to be cured by ayahuasca. Everyone thought I was crazy. Um, and I was doing it along with prayers, I was doing it along with, um, ritual. I was doing, I was having a, um, just a whole load of stuff, a whole load of medicines all together in a very specific context. You know, I had a, a, an old lady who was, who took three leaves and did the sign of the cross over my wound, uh, every day, you know, <clears throat> now there is no way you can study that thing, that, that kind of thing with science. It's literally impossible. What are you going to do? You're going to find some other English guy with leishmaniasis in the jungle and you're going to feed him something which tastes a bit like ayahuasca and then run that experiment a hundred times and see what you can't do it. It's simply science not the capacity to analyze that kind of thing. And that's, that's a, that's fine. You know, it's fine if science is not your only means to knowledge and you've got other means to knowledge and science makes space. When I say science, let's, let's call it what it really is, which is scientism, which is a type of, religious deference to the authority of the peer review process and the institutions which uh practice it pursue it right um well i feel like okay so the, you, you you've you've dropped a, a lot a lot of stuff here um or you've you've offered a lot of things um i think one of the first things i want to say is that early in, in, you were talking about how you don't need scientific authorities to tell you whether or not it is or is not okay for you to smoke a joint I agree, but from an alteration of public policy, I think it's it's throwing out the baby out with the bathwater to think that none of the scientific investigation that went into that played any role in the shifting of policy and public opinion over time. Um, maybe not the primary role, but certainly a role. Um, now, the comments about vitamin D, I found that that whole watching that unfold was very interesting and i wondered a lot about the and and i think we would agree here on the sort of like the paradigm and the mindset behind the people who are attempting to manipulate and control what information was perceived in what way to you know to forward or or sort of like nudge or you know you know direct um, public opinion on things so that the public thinks about things in a particular way. Um, and vitamin D was a good example of things being sort of at the very least, not actually not considered in policy, but like, I didn't realize it had even been explicitly removed, um, from PubMed. Um, and also on another end, I can understand, and this, I think, I don't think this is, I'm saying this neutrally. I can understand, you know, a desire to not, uh, stoke, sort of anti-scientific or anti-COVID theories if people are downloading and getting data that they don't fully understand from a from an article, but the censorship actually, you know, ended up probably making it worse because then it breeds further conspiracies, which may very well be some of which 
may very well be valid. Um, but the idea that what you had just said there, that, th that not all science is being interfered with as a consequence of entrenched beliefs, maybe the core of those beliefs being something like, we know what is the right way to believe and engage the world, right? But that some of these, some of these areas of science are not being, you know, interfered with and others are and fair enough but then you i'm wondering about what sounded like at the end there you starting to conflate all science and this is my concern is like a discussion around all <coughs> science is sort of like you know we can't trust in science period science is scientism where i think that it's important maybe to differentiate where pockets of scientism and pockets of manipulation of what research gets funded how that research is presented whatever else you know in order to alter or i don't know mm -hmm. where's where's my language here like i think it's important to sort of be differentiating that because i i guess maybe this is my own thing here but it's like there i think there's a lot of very valid and important reason to sustain maintain and even expand the reach of science as a, as a means of investigation of the natural world to inform decisions and policy. And I also see that there's a certain mindset, which I don't think is exclusive to science by any means, you know, that is almost antithetical to sci the scientific method, right? That is creating sort of dangerous blinders to how policy moves forward, how society moves forward, how science itself would move forward if science could be used as a noun. So I'm, I'm just, I feel like this is a really big thing. <laughs> We're like mm -hmm. kind of in the, in the thick of, in the thick of it now. Um, and I'm trying to make sense of it as, as we're talking about it. And so my, my concern still remains about like this throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So if you're talking about scientism, I get that. And is that a devaluing of science completely? And so it, the manipulation of the vitamin D data, does that mean we shouldn't believe any of the science about COVID? You know, like to, to what end do you think would be the appropriate response here to this kind of information or, or this, this kind of observations of how information is being produced and distributed? That, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's lots of good questions in there and they're important points. So I think the first thing I would say is um, about this throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I'm going to defer to Dr. Richard Horton on this. Uh, he is the editor of The Lancet, which is uh, one of the oldest medical journals. And he said that half of the medical literature is false. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's the editor of The Lancet. Right. That's not me. Um, there was a attempted replication of 100 studies in psychology and they managed to replicate uh, these are kind of landmark studies which built up the science of psychology. Um, they managed to replicate, I believe it was about a third of them. Yeah, the others were false replications. Now, one of the, uh, when we talk about the scientific method, one of the principles of the scientific method is that studies must be re replicable. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you have to be able to do it over and over again. Now, there's 100 studies. I think they, I don't know how the 100 were selected, but I think it was the, the most, the top um, top studies or something like that. They weren't just, they were, they were a bunch of studies. I'm actually going to look it up uh, whilst we're talking. Um, but if they can't be replicated, then they have violated the scientific method, right? And the scientific method, you have to go back to Bacon. Um, and I've got a whole lot of time for Bacon. Um, and, and I've got a whole lot of time for the scientific method. You know, I did my, uh, I did my degree in, uh, in life sciences and I mean, that's my second book. And I believe it's got, um, 10,048 uh, uh, citations in it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Some of those Bible, but a load of those are, uh, are science. So I, I, I take my data from scientific studies, right? Mm -hmm. But I go and read the actual studies. Um, I don't mean to sound like a dick by saying that. But um, um, so, yes, there's, it's, it's, it's very important to look at the world through the correlations that have been uh, deduced um, about the world. Um, but the step from there to say, now this is truth, you know, mm -hmm. something you brought up there, you know, it, this danger of people 
reading stuff and not understanding it suggests that there is a truth there behind that. And that's a philosophical point of whether there is truth in the first place, which is, which is one point. But then there's a, then there's a philosophical point, which actually Bacon himself brought up. He talked about the four idols, which, uh, interrupt, uh, our, um, appreciation of the world. And he talked about the, some of them are embedded in language, you know, the way that we speak. Um, some of them are, one of them is the idol of the marketplace, you know, uh, how do we um, kind of big up our own our own things? The idol of the he talked about the cave as well, which is basically the fact that we we believe what we uh, what the people around us like uh, believe or the, the kind of um, the cave that we live in, you know. Um, so there are a lot of and, and and Bacon. So he said what we need to do is we need to collect, collect observations, and then we need to tabulate observations, and then we need to deduce laws from those observations. And those observations should be um, replical, like I said. Um, so, for example, there was a good example is the, is the swan. Um, in Europe, when science was being developed, you know, this is, this is uh, one of the examples, uh, all swans are white. Are right, uh, white. Yeah, so you, you put, to put forward a hypothesis, all the swans are white, if we're talking about popper style uh, falsificationism in science. So you, you, you propose a, a theory or a a hypothesis and then the science is the business of trying to disprove a hypothesis that's mm-hmm. what most people think of as the as scientific method so the hypothesis is um all swan all swans are white yeah and you observe a swan in uh england and you observe a swan in france and they're both white and you observe one in the morning one in the evening and they're both white and you observe one at um sea level you observe one on top of a mountain if you manage to drag a swan up to the top of the mountain um <clears throat> they're all white but then when the when people got to Australia, they found actually there's black swans in Australia. And they didn't know that. And, oh, I see. So how many observations of a swan do you need to know to establish that all swans are white if you haven't discovered Australia yet? You know. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole problem with not just science, but actually rationalism, which is the idea that you can know the world by analyzing what you, the small amount of the world that you already know, which is obviously not the entire world. And then you go into the indigenous world, and they're getting information about plants from spirits. And in our perspective on what that is, we, I mean, if we're being generous in the academy, we might think you might kind of, kind of clap it in a way you might say, oh, well done to a little kid who's done a finger painting. Yeah, yeah, Isn't that yeah, nice? You've, you've, yeah. you've discovered something about curare um, or enz- enzyme inhibition. That's an interesting one, enzyme inhibition. We'll come back to that one. Uh, or you'll say, these people think they hear spirits these people are insane right that's pathology that's psychopathology in terms of uh in terms of psychiatry you you hear voices you you keep that to yourself in fact most people do keep that to themselves a lot of people do hear voices but don't tell anyone because it's like classic you're mad right Mm -hmm. so take enzyme inhibition for example right enzyme inhibition was discovered um in the um i believe it's in the in the in the uh when was it exactly? It was in the 20th century at some point. I wish I'd uh, wrote down some notes. You know, I wrote this book, I don't know, about five years ago now, so I'm a little bit rusty. I, I should probably reread it. Um, but enzyme uh, inhibition was discovered by mistake. It was discovered when there was some uh, research going on into one drug, um, and uh, it wasn't like a uh, psychiatric drug. It was for, I can't remember what it was, with diabetes or something like this. And they found that the people on this got happier. And they looked into why, and they found out that this particular thing inhibited um, enzymes, right? Now, indigenous people in the Amazon have been combining monoamine oxidase and DMT since, well, there's archaeological finds which go back thousands of years, right? And then if you go into the, um, well, all the way back to the Middle Bronze Age in Egypt, there was the combination of cinnamon and cassia, which are two different types of cinnamon, and myrrh, which is another example of enzyme inhibition. Yeah, uh, They may not have languaged it as en- enzyme inhibition, but they knew that you could make myrrh stronger as a drug, both as a, uh, and that's when I, when I say that, I mean both its um, pharmacological effects and also its effects on psychology, effect on perception and that kind of thing, by combining cinnamon and cassia. Now, fast forward to now, okay, we know about the cytochrome system, we know there's six cytochrome enzymes which inhibit, um, uh, which work on drugs, and we know that five of them are inhibited by cinnamon, and we know that one of them is inhibited by cassia, right? Now, 
no one noticed that in the Bible, right? We go, we have that data for 3,000 years. Yeah, I'm giving a talk on this on Sunday at a Jewish psychedelics conference. Um, why didn't anyone notice that? Why does it left to me? You know, my Hebrew is pretty poor. My psychopharmacology is, um, uh, I'm not particularly trained in that. Um, I learned what I know about enzyme inhibition off the internet, but I've discovered something like that in this ancient book, right? Now that doesn't say to me, I'm fantastically clever. That says to me, people are just not looking properly, right? Because all I had to do was go and look up cinnamon, look up cassia and work out the ph pharmacology of it. And, oh, there's a big revelation. That's not a revelation. It's just someone paying attention, you know? So, so what, what was the kind of thinking that went into the idea that there's absolutely no way that the combination of oils in the Bible or resins in the Bible was even worth the attention of, uh, I don't know, how many PhDs do you think there are in um, psychopharmacology, uh, in biochemistry, molecular biology, you know? Um, how, how did they miss that? You know? So that, that also tells me about where, where, science is, where scientism is focused at, and it's saying, well, that's religion, so we're not going to talk about it, we're not going to look at it. You know, but that's in the indigenous world. We're not particularly interested in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I feel, and from what I understand, you know, I, 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 I grasp that there are that science as an institution has sort of like a, a an almost um, uh, what's the word Hip hypocrisy in the uh, uh, like the certainty of its own like the of its own closed-minded sort of manipulation of what is or is not even worthy of wondering about um and how you're allowed to wonder about a thing i think it's all fine and good to sustain and maintain scientific method but reading uh say monica gagliano a doctor from or like a research scientist from australia doing research into plant intelligence and communication in her book, she talks about having published this paper on how plants sort of like are communicating and that it got refused and rejected in all these different places because she didn't do science right, which was that she didn't already have an idea of what the me mechanism is before she investigated it. So the fact that she investigated it, noticed a phenomenon and didn't have an explanation meant that it wasn't real science, right? And so- and yet that type of what she discovered and what followed up from that and it ends ends up in my opinion being incredibly important information for getting a sense of life on this planet right not the only way so i can i can see this sort of like this this closed mindedness that manipulates um manipulates what gets researched what's get what gets validated what gets looked into you know how much you know, the manner of our approach and regard of the world sort of like self reinforces the perceptions of things that we're already receptive to and likely and expecting to perceive. And, and, and that certainty obfuscating and, and omitting a number of other things that are possibly right there, you know, to, to investigate. So I can, I can definitely see that there's like, um, there, there's a fundamental problem and it might be a, an ego superiority problem, a cultural ego superiority problem, as well as an industrial sort of who gets what funding and you don't want to disrupt the ideological sort of, uh, you know, sensitivity of who's providing the funding in order to, you know, actually get your recognition in science. And you can't do science if you don't have the money to do the research in academia, right? So there's 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 a lot of issues there. So so I, and and I'll, I ask you please to comment on that. But then my question now is the fact that this is something that is increasingly recognized by yourself, by me. I mean, mind you. I'm by no means a scientific authority on anything, right? But even other, you know, like deeply invested people in science, I I know a lot of people who have gone through their PhD and come out the other side being like the ac like academia is broken. It's just a money machine now and isn't actually about the the values it proclaims to to found it. Is that itself not a product of science in a sense? Is it not itself a self-correcting system by the fact that we are now increasingly recognizing its limitations 
Um, I'm going to answer something else first. Um, okay. yeah. The uh, that thing about um, the plant scientist who had to have a mechanism before she published, right? Mm -hmm. That isn't science. That is a betrayal of science. And that's not just um, Bacon, that's Newton, right? Newton's, Newton's, uh, Newton has a quote about how when we're doing science, experimental science, we're not looking for theories. You know, theories have nothing whatsoever to do with science. That's what he says, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, and, 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 you know, this other question that you asked, um, is science not the way that we can um, change policy, for example? Well, I don't know, was Catholicism, was that capable of changing the power dynamics in 13th century Europe? No, it wasn't. I wouldn't it know. Was, <laughs> well, yeah. I have to trust your perspective on that as, a, um, as but, an authority on the subject. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> The oh, it was the Reformation, you know. It was the Reformation tore down the power of the of of, of the Catholics, right? Mm -hmm. So, so in the Catholic um, cosmovision, let's say the world was at the center of the universe, and um, which isn't biblical, by the way, um, and it's it was eternal, which also isn't biblical. It doesn't say any of that in the Bible, but that's what the Catholics are believing at that time. And then when Galileo comes along, uh, famously, and says, "Look." There's moons going around Jupiter. Um, look through my telescope. The church authority said, your telescope is broken. Um, you're talking nonsense because we're going back to our book, right? And we have a theory about this, right? So when, you, when, when the theory becomes more important than the data, yeah, you're, you're not doing what Bacon, who invented the invented science, would have called science. You're not doing mm -hmm. what Newton, who was pretty tough at science, uh, was doing. You're doing ideology, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a question of, yes, there are people who go through the system, uh, spend all that time getting their PhDs, and then realize, ah, oh, yes, this is, there's more to life than this. That's great. So science, actual science as a path towards knowledge, beautiful. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful set of techniques. It's a wonderful culture. And um, it's also a kind of shared language of discourse. You know? So we can, um, we can talk about uh, plants in the Amazon and we can talk about plants in the Bible, and uh, we can talk. We can talk about plants known to the Inuits or whoever you know um, through the language of science. So this is great. You know, we can talk about um, uh, we can talk about dopamine um, receptors, and it's a it's a shared language, and we can, and that's just a wonderful thing. It's it's, um, but. The idea that the authority system is going to dismantle itself, I think, is um, a little bit far-fetched. Um, mm -hmm. It certainly hasn't happened so far. I mean, take another example. What was it that liberated, say, liberated women, gave women the vote in England, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, if you go all the way back, women didn't get the vote. Well, women didn't have um, rights in the medieval times, uh, the same rights as men, because it was them who tempted uh, it was Eve who tempted, who was tempted by the snake and they have intrinsic weakness, right? Mm. Fast forward into the scientific era. Oh, it's because their brains are smaller, right? Uh, or it's because they have, uh, uh, hysterium, which means a womb. So they are subject to hysteria, which is the disease which is caused by wombs. You know, you have, um, psychiatrists, early psychiatrists who will, who there was a name of a disease. I can't remember the name of it, but it was the disease that makes slaves run away. And the treatment oh, for it was to cut off their big toes. Jesus right? Christ. Um, if you look at the kind of racial science, and um, I could go on and on and on, but there's always been uh, support for any kind of oppression, racism, sexism, um, uh, destruction of um, indigenous and traditional communities, um, which is still going on. You know, I watched... Um, What's her name? Um, Dayara Tukano, who's an indigenous activist. Um, she was giving a talk uh, at the Shakuna Plant Sciences Conference on the weekend, last weekend. And she said something very interesting. She said, every time we meet you, it ends up with basically genocide. Yeah. Um, and let's not pretend this is any different. Um, so it would be in the same way that the Catholic Church, 
the Catholic Church did not protect the indigenous people from the, so there was a conquest which involved going to get gold and going to spread the book, right? The book that was spread did not protect indigenous people from that conquest, right? No, uh, it was now, its own kind of conquest as well. Yeah, exactly. So you do get all kinds of syncretisms, don't get me wrong. There were individual priests uh, and uh, even up until, I mean, there's quite an interesting story there the, um, which relates to my other work, which is I, I work with a reforestation organization. Um, but there's, a, there's a, a recent video we've just released with the Nokikoya indigenous nation. And um, it's a song about the fires that burnt them out of their land uh, about 100 years ago called the Correios. It's a particularly dark part of Brazilian history where people of slave descent from the uh, northeast were sent over to the northwest. Uh, northwest. Yeah, to over to the northwest where the Amazon is uh, to drive uh, indigenous people out of their land. And <clears throat> this was going on for quite a while. And then the church authorities found out about it. Well, they, they knew about it, but they had to go and intervene. And they intervened by going and baptizing people. And the indigenous people came in their tens of thousands down the rivers. And they said, hey, you've got to go and get get this guy to go and do some weird thing with some water and then they won't kill you anymore because now you've got a soul, right? So don't get me wrong, there is, the Catholic Church actually did protect some indigenous people uh, through this process of conversion. And in the same way, science will protect some aspects of um, indigenous culture by saying, oh, I see, look, they've discovered something over here. Maybe we should look after this plant. You know, ayahuasca is a good example, right? Mm -hmm. um, now we've got, all kinds of people wanting to decontextualize ayahuasca and use it in therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of whom, I'd say most of whom, have have a great deal of knowledge about um, receptors, but don't know ayahuasca. Right. right? They haven't done fifty ceremonies, a hundred ceremonies, uh, and been through it. You know, been through the training. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ayahuasca is going to be protected, uh, in, incorporated into um, some kind of dominant extractive model of capitalism mm -hmm. but what about all the other plants what about all the other practices what about all the other cultural expressions you know do we see a, a do we see the same kind of um worldwide movement from people who look like us to protect um let's say uh samaoma trees uh for example uh, no we don't um or the beetles that live in those particular parts no mm -hmm. why do we in that, well, we've got experience with it, a whole bunch of science, which is backing it up. But science, as I said, only focuses on one thing. It extracts one thing from a system, and then it focuses on that. To hell with the rest of the system, you know? And that's my, that's my, that's my complaint with, that's, that's one of my complaints about it as a, um, as a force for colonialism. Hmm. Well, I, I, yeah, I completely see and have already for some time, definitely a uh, appreciated science as being used as a as a force for colonialism and you know the sort of institutions the ideology behind the institutions of science really forwarding that type of way in the world um and my wondering about the sort of self-correction you know is people within the institutions doing actual science that aren't necessarily also sort of proponents and perpetuators of this sort of like ideological superiority complex um, that exists in, uh, in, in sort of like the dominant culture right now, or the dominant Western culture, dominant in the sense that it seems to dominate whatever culture it tries to get its hands on and extract from, and dominant in the sense that it... Um, is sort of like a prevailing way of being in the world across the Western world of perceiving the world, um, that they, that, that agents within it, you know, introduce instability, introduce reformation and stuff like that over time. That's, that's what I was wondering about. I don't think ide ideologies certainly don't alter themselves by simply continuing for long enough. Right. That, that, that's what I, that's what I meant by that. Hmm. And I, I'm wondering too, oh, go ahead. So yes, to answer that, well, let's be scientific about it. Let's collect sure. the data and let's look at it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many times have uh, scientists stopped in the past, let's say the past 200 years, how many times have scientists the oppression of uh, a, particular, um, a particular race, gender, gr group? Mm. No, I, I, this, know, this is, I'm not saying the institution itself, but agents within it that alter no, over I mean, time because 
But that's what I mean. How many times has somebody inside science managed to, uh, what I would call a genuine scientist, has managed to overcome the, the cogs of scientism and imperialism in order to, uh, in order to reverse that, in order to actually protect something or someone, right? And, and it would be nice to know because I can think of plenty of examples where, as I say, people have been exploited, uh, killed, enslaved, um, and there have been dissenting voices. I'm not saying there weren't. There have always been dissenting voices against imperialism. Often they come from outside. outside um, the institutions, yeah. The institutions, yeah. Um, but, but I can't think of too many examples where a species has been saved or, a, or, or something like that. In fact, I can't think of a single example. You know, so let's be scientific. Let's not be romantic about this. Let's not say, "Oh, wouldn't it be lovely if it was if it kind of mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. there was some kind of explosion from the inside?" I think maybe in psychedelics, you know, because psychedelics almost force you to think when they're well, by definition they're mind opening, aren't they? So if your mind is trammeled psychedelia, uh, sorry, trammeled um, kind of scientific, let's say logical po- logical positivism then it will it can force you outside uh, outside of there but even in that kind of field the yeah. desire to control psychedelics is i mean it's 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 horrific and and i'll tell you another thing actually i've been recently been uh, had the privilege I, I, like i say i'm going to do this jewish psychedelics conference on the weekend um i just wonder where these guys were when we were getting arrested you know where were these priests where were these rabbis you know uh, um Suddenly, the world seems to be getting into psychedelics. How can we mix psychedelics with this practice and that practice? Hmm, okay. Is this a soft form of colonialism we're seeing here? You know? Um, why are we trying to incorporate into our practice? Why aren't we looking at how people use their psychedelics in their indigenous, in their indigenous context? Hmm. You know? And you do hear lips, you do, people pay lip service to this, right? Um, but in terms of, I'll give you an example. How many of the studies into the efficacy of, uh, let's say, ayahuasca, in the psychological studies, and we've got lots of studies on how it's healed this, healed that, and healed the other, um, how many of them have looked into sexual dieta? You know, are people, have people not had sex for three days or a month or a week before they've done the test? And I've looked into this, none of them, not a single one. They don't even ask it on the question. Yeah. Mm. How many of them are asking questions about what stage of, of uh, someone's menstrual cycle? they're in when they go and have uh when they go and um they don't. well if you yeah. ask too so, many questions um, danny then you're going to muddy the data and you won't be able to get a clear you know theory at the end of it and thus you won't get published and thus you won't get more funding and thus you won't be able to change anything and so if you want to do something good you have to manipulate what you're looking at to get the results that other people will celebrate i mean i'm um, that, that I, I might be sort of like narrow-mindedly mischaracterizing or characterizing just the worst but i i I, I, that's kind of what you're pointing at right there's a slight error there actually um you can ask as many questions you like what in in the scientific method is collecting data and then tabulating data it doesn't say you have to tabulate all the data Hmm. it says collect data and then tabulate data and then develop laws no you can ask as many questions as you like whether they come out in the in the results and the analysis that's your business mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. the fact that they haven't even asked the question in the beginning it's not because it muddies the data it's because they're sure. not interested in the question okay yeah thanks for clarifying that hmm. <laughs> sorry i said authoritarian there um, <laughs> no i mean like it's fair you 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 have i you know i'm 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 not entirely out of my element here. Like I think about these things, I observe these things, I read about these things. And also, you know, I'm very much like having this conversation. I'm I'm challenged on the edge of my own assumptions as much as I am, you know, challenged on the edge of the of the of the content itself, right? And and there's still like there's still a part of me clinging on. And possibly it's a part of me that is that it's like, no, no, no. I mean, stay with science. Right. If if I look around the world at sort of like I think what Eric Davis calls like the liquefying of reality, and there's a lot of people talking about essentially the dissolution of 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 sort of authority for sense making the world. Um, there are places where I kind of feel like I still would like to lean into, right? Um, and also I. I also, I don't know, so many things just came up. One thing was like learning how to critically assess data. Another thing is like learning how to sort of think critically, wonder about our own biases and 
another part of me was there was just like a lot of stuff that's coming up. So mm -hmm. I'm definitely like in the conversation. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm inspired. I'm reactive. I'm protective about things. I don't know. I'm also sort of protective about things that I feel strongly about that I think are so valid, you know? So this is, this has been a very interesting on uh, uh, conversation. And one thing that sort of keeps circling back is this sort of like, oh, I'm thinking about, um, about, uh, oh, what was her name? Um, uh, Flanders in the Simpsons, Ned Flanders and his wife who got killed. Um, she was always like, would somebody please just think of the children? Right? I remember so, the one here. Yeah. So, so, so this type of, um, Maud, that was her name, Maud Flanders, this type of like, think of the children, which is like, you know, think of how much anti-science. And I don't think what, I, I think the things that we're discussing here today aren't what I'm thinking of, like characterizing in my mind as anti-science. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about incredibly sort of seemingly like well coherent criticisms of the ideological underpinning of essentially like colonialism and rationalism and some sort of spiritually, uh, you know, in my language, like spiritually impoverished sort of detachment and sort of like self aggrandizing. Mm -hmm. I wonder about this too, about like the hierarchy of life and human at the top of the hierarchy in science and even atheism being a direct extension of monotheistic sort of like all creatures on life are under the domain of man or whatever else. Um, but I'm hearing what oh fuck I got just got lost in my own comment. Oh yeah. So I'm hearing all of this and I'm just wondering about like, you know, how do we have, how do we have this conversation in a way that doesn't create reference points for, all right, that confirms my bias towards anti-science and towards disbelief in information that might otherwise be, especially right now, and maybe I'm a product of the propaganda, information that is making the difference between people dying or not, because we're in a pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So like, I'm really like, I, I don't know, I'm asking these questions out loud mm -hmm. and I'm wondering about them. Um, yeah. Well, let me answer three of them then. Um, okay. Firstly, about this grasping, right? Um, you, we have to grasp for something, right? Being yeah. without a theory is terrifying. It's like being out at sea without a boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how do we do anything if we don't have a theory about it? If you see a madman in the street, right? How do you know to approach him? Right? Do you gym? with uh, an injection of something that will calm him down, do you approach him with a crucifix, right? Sure. But you can't just leave a madman in the street, you know, you've got to do something. Um, so there's a good reason why we need theories to deal with stuff. And there's also a kind of, um, the thing about grasping, and just to use your word, if you, I, I, I adore science, actually. I, I, I really like uh, looking into data. One of, the, one of the particular bits of data I was interested in was uh, the grasp reflex in uh, babies because yeah? yeah. when I had a child I thought oh that's interesting um, babies who are anxious grasp more yeah babies who are less anxious grasp less and the reason they grasp less and this apparently goes back all the way this is the, this is the theory goes back all the way to um, when we were up in trees you know grabbing onto the tree when there was danger was the uh, sensible reflex you know it was a sensible thing to do so by nature when we are more anxious we grasp more yeah so when you have um, competing theories, and they're competing in the sense of actually over literally over territory, yeah, mm -hmm. people are much more firm in their um, in their ideas. And you know, Robert Anton Wilson said this: convictions cause convicts, right? <laughs> and um, so, how do we pursue the conversation? We pursue this conversation by being respectful of each other's. Um, I don't mean you and me. I mean, uh, like let's say the the scientific world and the indigenous world being respectful of each other's knowledge traditions, right? And that doesn't mean paying lip service to them. That means actually investigating them and saying, what's going on here? So when I hear questions like going back to psychedelics, but it could be in other areas, this thing in the media recently, do, do practitioners who are administering psychedelics to, uh, in, in the therapeutic session, do they need to have experience of, of those psychedelics? You know? Yeah, that's such an important question to be having right now. Yeah. Fucking crazy question. Yeah. I mean, the fact that even someone can even ask that question, even, even imagine it's possible. Because mm -hmm. in the indigenous world, you would be, I don't know what would happen to you if you tried to give someone ayahuasca without having, ever having taken ayahuasca before. I hope something awful would happen to you. You know, <laughs> um, that's, um, 
that's uh, that 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 knowledge system is so detached from any other knowledge system. You know, would you teach someone how to drive if you didn't have you could, if you hadn't driven a car? I mean, it's bonkers. It's a bonkers way of thinking. Um, I mean, it comes and, and it comes from a, it comes from maybe a misunderstanding of the experience too. Because I I spoke with somebody else who was very supportive of psychedelic therapy, an established um, and highly respected sort of psychologist uh, and trauma specialist, and his perspective was something along the lines of like. Uh, do I have to have, do I have to have taken Prozac to prescribe Prozac? Well, that's like a fundamental misunderstanding of sort of like the underpinning sort of like meaning basis and the meaning medicine of a yeah. psychedelic experience that is extremely mediated by context, especially, you know, the context, uh, like the, the sort of the narrative context you know, and the sort of interpersonal context of how that sense making of what that meaningful experience was, you know, with the person who helped facilitate it. So, sorry, I, I derailed you. Please, please continue. No, no, it's cool. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, meaning is what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. And um, we do, we are healed through meaning. Um, I, I believe that and I've been very, very ill and I've come through it, but it was a shifting cosmovision, which, which did it right. And we get our meaning from school and we get our meaning from, a system which is so imperial that it doesn't it doesn't even bear, bear talking about it's, it's uh, the hierarchies are, are imposed right from the beginning right from mm-hmm. right from the moment you're born and the doctor slaps you and injects you with vitamin k um quite an interesting one i remember when i was uh, when my kid was uh when my third kid was born um the doctor was injecting him with vitamin k and i said why do you want to do that and it's because like one in ten thousand kids um has a blood clot uh, oh no, it doesn't have enough vitamin K. That means it might get hemorrhage and da 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 da. And I looked into that. I thought, oh, that's very interesting. I looked into vitamin K, and then I looked into. I ended up in obviously where I usually end up, which is in ancient um, Hebrew texts, and I found out something really interesting because vitamin K spikes at day eight in 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 a baby's life. So basically, you have you you can have no vitamin K at the beginning of your life. Vitamin K, by the way, is what makes blood coagulate. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you if you have a cut and you don't have any vitamin K, you can bleed out. So yeah, it also has to do with like uh, calcium transport in the body too, if I understand correctly. Yeah, yeah. So you got vitamin K twelve, I think. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them, um, but uh, I might be wrong about that. But yes, so, vit- so the the one that they were injecting was 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 about this uh, blood coagulation. I looked into it and I looked into vitamin K and I found out something fascinating was that it peaks at eight days. Yeah. Now, what do I know that happens at eight days in Jewish Well, circumcision happens at eight days, right? Isn't that interesting? So Sorry, the circumcision reason, happens at eight days, did you say? Okay, yeah. 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 So the exact day when, the, when you are best at blood clotting in your entire life is the day when Jews and going back beyond Israelites practice circumcision. That shows incredibly high degree of knowledge and understanding of of, of the human organism if they, if they chose the right day. Now, here's another thing. There is one time when you don't circumcise a baby in the Jewish tradition, and that's if the baby's yellow. Why is that? It means it's because it's jaundiced, and it's got uh, liver problems, and liver is where vitamin K is produced, right? Now, do I, my baby wasn't yellow, right? And I draw my knowledge from an older and wiser tradition than this guy who thinks, well, we just got to inject them all because one in 10,000 or however many is, might get a blood clot and we're too stupid to look and see if it's yellow or not. You know, I don't, I don't follow kind of, um, that's not my authority. Yeah. I know more than you <laughs> mm. <laughs> in that kind of thing. Um, and, and it's because I haven't focused my, 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 uh, my investigation in that direction, you know? Um, I want to say something else. We're talking about anti-science. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, cause you, I, I, you said that you had three of my questions you could answer and anti-science was wrapped yeah. up in it, especially during the era yeah. of pandemic, pandemic, pandemic life. So, and we're talking here about, um, conspiracy theory. And I know Eric Davis, uh, has a, quite a rap on this. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, what is conspiracy theory? And, uh, one of the ways of, of looking at it is in the sociology of rumor. And there's something very interesting about rumors. Um, What rumors get transmitted? What stories do people tell? Yeah, and there's certain ones, there's a good example is alligators in the sewers of New York, right? This has been persistent rumor for, uh, I think, since the 70s, since 
people are still telling each other there are alligators in the sewers of New York, right? There aren't any alligators. In, they haven't found, I want to say there aren't any, they haven't found any alligators in the sewers of New York, but people are still telling the story. Mm-hmm. Why are they still telling this story and not a whole load of other friends of friends stories or, or nonsense stories? Well, there is something in the fact that there are these reptilian forces underneath New York, which could tear you to pieces. Um, there's a mythic truth in that. There's an essential truth in that. If you look at, um, you know, Wall Street, um, it tells a story, doesn't it? Um, mm. I'll give you another example of a, of a, of a conspiracy theory. And I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not giving that any, I'm not saying if it's true or not conspiracy theory amongst the black community, which was that AIDS was created by the American government and given to black people. Right mm-hmm. now, I don't know whether that's true or not. I wouldn't like to say, uh, it's not widely believed. Um, but it, have some credence in the black community. The black community was subject to, uh, well, basically the American government was getting crack and introducing it into black communities, right? Mm-hmm. So even if the actual theory of AIDS was created by the government and given to black people is not true, it speaks to a mythic truth, an essential truth, which is the government has, and still is, uh, oppressing the black community mm-hmm. through all kinds of all kinds of means, right? So when we talk about, and this is this is, I think this is really important. Um, what we believe is one thing; the stories that we tell is another thing, right? And what stories get passed on. So I'm quite happy actually to see a lot of skepticism about science, um, a lot of skepticism about kind of the COVID propaganda, and I use that term in the in the in the in the sense of actually Hitler's laws of propaganda. Which are right. there are five of them. Um, let me just dig them up here so I can speak with a bit of authority on this. Yeah, so Hitler's laws of propaganda, uh, there are five of them, right? One of them is avoid abstract ideals, appeal to the emotions. Hitler actually said, I save reason for uh, the few, and I use emotions on the many, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, constantly repeat just a few ideas use stereotyped phrases, right? Um, in England, we have uh, stay home, save lives. Yeah, mm-hmm. everywhere, all over the place. Um, stereotyped phrases. Um, give only one side of the argument. We're seeing all kinds of censorship on, we've already talked about. Continuously criticize your opponents, right? Uh, you're getting all kinds of very well, um, um, people with all kinds of letters after their names who are getting dissed all over the place uh, for, um, critiquing the, this idea that there's this, um, that this pandemic is, let's say the response to the pandemic is, um, is appropriate to the degree of the severity then of the, of the pandemic, and then pick out one special enemy for special vilification. So these are Hitler's law, Hitler's rules. So I think the kind of the way that anti-vax people have been treated is very much a special enemy. Um, it's, you know, it's right up there with flat earthers, Mm -hmm. no disrespect to the flat earth community. Um, it's a very easy target, isn't it? Look at these people who are scared of uh, needles or believe all this kind of shit about vaccines. Um, sure. Similar for like anti, anti mask um, people, anti mask people making air quotes for audio listeners. Uh, yeah. Anti mask. I mean, look at the data on that. What is it? I mean, again, I'm not going to throw a whole load of data at you, um, because you can look it up yourself, but there is a you know, the, the who was anti-masks right at the beginning, right? The WHO. Mm-hmm. And then it changed its tune, you know? Um, well, the, that was, that was a weird sort of way in which they were actively sort of manipulating data in order to like, what was it? Fauci admitted that he said masks didn't work to try to get the public not to use up medical supplies that for the people that needed it because it, they did work. But, and I think anyways, that's a, <laughs> Yeah, the data on whether masks is, I mean, in, in states where they have a mask mandate, I'm not going to go down there, actually. Uh, the okay. data on whether masks work or not is extremely um, debatable, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so that would be another one, right? And, and then we look at, so propaganda, the nature of propaganda is to, again, Hitler said, uh, truth is the best propaganda, right? Um, propaganda isn't about lying people get confused about, about that propaganda is about focusing on one aspect of the truth and exploding it up. 
right? So what else do masks do? Well, there's a whole load of children, I forget the statistics, um, who are now having dreams about faceless figures. Yeah, mm -hmm. because then they're seeing masks over the place. You know, my kids have just gone back to school after a year being away from school. The older ones, they're 12. And they're 12. They're in a big school, right? That's hard. It's hard anyway, trying mm -hmm. to work out what people are thinking. And now they've got to try and read people without being able to see their, their mouths, you know. Yeah. Um, what is the impact of that on on all the other things that are important in life, other mm -hmm. than whether you've got COVID or not, you know? So there's a whole... There's a whole story there. And then there's this kind of nonsense. If I, if I forget to ask on the train, what do I do? Um, uh, I can go and get one from, like I went to the dentist the other day. I forgot my mask, uh, obviously. And um, there was a pile of masks there. So I picked up a mask and I probably got all kinds of diseases and all the other masks as well. Um, you know, it's a piece of surgical equipment that's used in a surgical fashion. When you when um, when uh, when they're being used in a doctor, you don't tie your own mask. You get someone else to tie your mask so you don't mess with it. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so that's um, so this twenty four seven uh, focus on the um, on the uh, on this pandemic and how, how how devastating it is. You know, as you probably know, the the the, the mortality rate is. I mean, it's not, 70 year olds aren't even that much at risk from COVID. You know, you have to, you have to be in your kind of late seventies. Most of the deaths are really, really old. Well, right? hey, well, hang, hang, hang for a second here because, because there's also, okay. And I don't know if this is, you know, a part of the same propaganda sort of campaign that you're talking about here. Right. Um, cause ultimately I don't know. I don't, I haven't looked under the microscope. Okay. Um, but like, there's the issue of increasingly more infectious and virulent variants. There's issues of things right now happening in India. You know, there's the obvious sort of like epidemi epidemiological sort of uh, evidence that the variant that came from your country of residence, the, your variant, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, you know, is is more infectious and all the rest and and and. And I mean, again, maybe part of the propaganda, it's not so much about how many people it kills proportionately. It's about how quickly, how many people get sick and how quickly the amount of people that it makes very sick and kills can <clears throat> overburden hospitals. And then the larger consequence of that on total death is greater as a consequence <clears throat> of health services not being able to respond to all forms of of serious illness, not just COVID. So there's, there's that in consideration too. And oftentimes when I hear people sort of like COVID isn't a thing because it doesn't kill very many people, you know, proportionately seem to sort of leave out that factor of consideration, the larger, the more complex yeah, no, picture of that. Yeah. I, I follow the argument. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, I'm not saying COVID isn't a thing. Um, statistically. So I didn't mean to say that no, that, no, that was your claim. Yeah. Um, um, statistically it kills about three times as much as a bad flu. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, that seems to be the, that's the data from all over the place. Um, in coming back to the care homes thing, and I'm going to take your other points in a minute in your Canadian. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in Canada, 80, 81% of the COVID deaths were in long-term care homes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nursing. Homes, yeah. Um, I believe that the average stay in I don't know about long term care the average stay in a care home is like, I think it's three months, something like that. You oh, go there yeah. to die. Right? You go there to die, um, essentially, yeah. 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 Um, and people died in care homes. And there's um, a lot, well, so, there's a lot there about how disgusting a lot of the care homes are for the amount of actual care they're providing older people, both on a physical end, but also on from like a meaning standpoint. And that could be a, like a lot of people end up in there and die, even though they weren't actually doing that bad off before they went in because of how yeah, it changes died. the meaning context of their life too. Um, so just well, kind of throwing died. that in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people die of dehydration. There's loads of deaths of dehydration in old people's homes because they don't give them water, you know. Fuck, um, so gross. But coming back to the question here about um, overburdening the health services, right? Um, well, in England, we built all these Nightingale hospitals. Uh, to deal with the uh, to deal with the overburdened health service, they weren't used, right? Mm. Um, they went out of the news. It was just massive, like uh, lots of this kind of uh, rhetoric about how we're going to build these things using the name of Florence Nightingale. Um, yeah, they weren't reused. Really My sister works; she's a, a pediatric doctor in a hospital. Um, 
you will probably, I mean, the care there, so to the, the argument that you advanced there is that um, overburdening the health surface has meant that all forms of other, other diseases aren't treated. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's, it's the other way around. Like cancers haven't been treated because loads of, loads of them haven't been diagnosed this year because people haven't been going into hospital. Surgeries right? are being canceled here in Ontario. Like cancer surgeries aren't happening, yeah. you know, and it's, and it's, it, it, well, also I, I, like I know ICU beds are kind of mac- – I was at the hospital the other day getting an MRI and I overheard the nurses saying like, hey, so our ICU is full now. And they're like, oh, really? And like, yeah, from COVID patients from Toronto and and whatever else. So it's like um, there's also sort of like a preparedness. People who need surgeries aren't getting it because they're trying to be ready for people who are – like if they get into ICU, I think there's a lot of people that end up just dying anyways. But um, – Anyways, uh, there, there's a yeah. lot there. I'm um, not. I'm also not trying to like take take sort of a stance for a particular no, it, way of it. seeing it. I'm just trying to it. introduce stuff. Yeah, I get yeah. it, and I want to unpack it a little bit as well yeah. because yeah. one of the when you get flu, right, you treat it with lemsip, you treat it with a whole load of stuff, right? We've got traditional treatments for that. If you go to a if you go and have a COVID test, my kids have COVID tests twice a week now. If you go and have a COVID test and they find you positive COVID, they don't tell you here's a whole load of treatments that you can take. Right. And now we've got, I mean, it could be ivermectin. It could be a whole load of other stuff if you want to be pharmaceutical about it. Um, or it could be the traditional antivirals. It could be the traditional liver support. It could be all the kind of, you know, just loads of garlic, all that kind of stuff. So this is, there's this idea that's happened with COVID and I got a fairly good reason, a fairly good idea of why, um, that they, that you can't treat the, you can't treat the symptoms of it. You know, you have to treat it through, um, either vectors or you have to treat it through, um, you you have to wait for the vaccine to be produced. Um, this is a very strange way to deal with disease, right? It's never, um, it's never happened before that we've, we've dealt with the disease by saying we can't help you, um, unless you're in hospital and you have to have a ventilator. Yeah. But that's been the, that's been the policy. Um, if someone is getting to the state of being in an ICU, they have gone very, very far down the pathology already, right? Mm -hmm. There's other aspects of when people get ill. So let's take, I mean, diabetes is a good example. No, sorry, obesity makes you, I think the mortality rate is something like two and a half times greater if you are diabetic, right? Uh, Sorry, if you're obese. We don't see a massive worldwide drive to cut down sugar, yeah? We We haven't got, you know, you could say that people are dying of air pollution, People don't really, it's very rare for you to die of COVID uh, if you don't have some kind of comorbid comorbidity, whether it's diabetes, uh, whether it's you live in, um, you've got like uh, asthma, for example. At least uh, as far as COVID initial sort of like expressions of COVID are, we don't know what those things are with variants. Although from what I understand, especially in India, there are people who are dying without, without knowing having any pre-established comorbidities morbidities and younger. So I think there needs to be a kept into consideration of how the virus itself well, could be changing okay, its so, impact too. Well, take the variants. So, so how do variants, I mean, COVID, COVID is what's called slippery. It's just, it, it genetically, uh, it mutates very quickly as viruses go. And it has been, I mean, in the first four months, there were already, um, I think, hundreds of, uh, of variations, right? The, the particular variation you're talking about of England comes from my, my not, it's not just my home country, it's my home county. Um, it's your well, fault, Danny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting just, my pitchforks. Uh, number one. Uh, so, um, when you, uh, if you basically incubate a virus, norm- normally in an epidemic situation, you would have a, you would have a, um, uh, a, a virus would very quickly move, right? Doesn't really have time to produce all these, um, all these variants produce all these, all the, or, 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 yeah, basically that if you, if you slow down, if you slow down the acquisition of herd immunity, yeah. Herd immunity used to be a biological concept. Now it's a political hot potato, mm-hmm. this idea that, you know, it means that you want to kill your parents. Um, sure. Herd immunity, I was learning about herd immunity when I was, I think, 16 at school, um, or certainly at university. Um, if you don't allow a, a population to establish herd immunity, then you open up um, and you don't allow a virus to transmit. Because normally what happens with viruses is they, they become less and less uh, virulent. Right? Measles. In measles, for example, it's, um, it doesn't really do much damage to people because a, a virus that does a lot of damage to people, like SARS is a good example. SARS was too aggressive 
and uh, it killed far too many people to spread very quickly because people got very, very sick very, very quickly, right? Um, so a virus, viruses generally mutate towards something that's less aggressive rather than right, but, but more Right, but SARS, SARS didn't end because it mutated away. It ended because it was able, it was a lot easier to contain SARS because you didn't spread it before you were sick. Um, like I, lo I looked into it. It's not like the, vi the SARS virus changed and we all just had it and it's all fine and good. According to the data, it, no, that's they what shut saying. it down, yeah. No, well, yeah. it shut itself down. It was so aggressive oh, okay. that I see what you're saying. people fall over before they've got on a plane to go and infect somebody else, yeah, right? Yeah, I see what you're saying. So, yeah. um, so if you, t I mean, COVID, depends how you look at it, but COVID is another very similar kind of SARS. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a new episode of SARS in, in a <laughs> Sorry, way. It's season new three. Coronavirus. Um, uh, yeah, SARS season three, yeah, three, season 19. Um, and... Um, uh, this was a much less aggressive one or a much less virulent one, but it took over a much greater, much greater area, right? This is a normal progression of viruses. Um, cause they want to coexist with us. You know, they don't want to, um, it's, 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 they are benefited from us. And I I think I want to say something else about viruses. Um, viruses are information, right? And code. And if we look into our history, the history of the interaction between humans and viruses, and in fact, animals and viruses, a lot of our uh, genetic code is made up of, of, of viral, viral DNA, yeah? Uh, and also a lot of our um, microbiome is also made up of viral DNA. So a good example of that uh, is, well, there's a, well, let's get back to the, there was a particular creature, particular type of shrew that survived the meteor wiped out the diner, right? Um, are you still with me? You just froze there for a second. Yeah, no, he's still with you. Okay. Um, okay, so when the dinosaurs were wiped out by this by this meteor, there's a particular type of shrew, and it survived. And it wasn't a mammal yet, but it was warm-blooded, right? And a virus got into this little mammal and got into its nuts or its ovaries, basically. And it's a retrovirus. So a retrovirus goes and inserts a chunk of its DNA into your DNA. Mm -hmm. And part of the... Um, what, uh, what one of the things that this virus did is it produced a kind of, um, a kind of glue basically, which, which allowed it to fuse to membranes inside the body. Yeah. Because that's what viruses need to do. They need to create stuff that fuses to, um, uh, to tissues and things like that. Right. So this, uh, this virus got into the, into the, into the gonads basically of, of this little shrew and passed then then passed into the bloodline of this, of this creature. So fast forward a few a few generations or a whole bunch of generations, and this bit of viral DNA was incorporated into the placenta, right? Because that same that same protein which which uh, allowed the virus to stick to membranes allowed the egg to stick to the fallopian tube. Um, is that bit of the and to create the womb around it? And lo and behold, we have uh, we have mammals, right? Mm -hmm. So mammals arise out of this bit of viral DNA that gets slotted into the, into the human. Well, well yeah, a human. lot, a lot, a, well, a lot of life came to be through <clears throat> sy symbiosis. Right. But then, you know, my, my, my wondering here, and, and maybe we can sort of veer off a little bit of from COVID um, and just kind of find a close around just like the um, good criticism for academic sciences authority over the world. Um, but like my, my wondering is about, not all viruses then are going to turn out to be positive. You know, it's like there are such things as invasive species that destroy stuff. It's not like, uh, and, and COVID fair enough is probably a response like a accidental or maybe intentional, depending on how we understand the consciousness of, of the planet ecosystem, you know, response to humans being and putting themselves places that they probably shouldn't be in ways that are causing more harm than good for the total life of the planet. Right. And, you know, if you assume the wet market kind of like distribution or the Zootonic transmission uh, sort of theory of how it came to be. Um, and so, you know, viruses aren't all the same. Some viruses are extreme and some viruses aren't necessarily something that we want spreading fast through the culture, spreading fast through the system, the species. And we have it now, you know, and is the response to say like, viruses aren't necessarily bad so we should just let it spread through and you know like 
the long-term consequences that human species as a whole will survive and whoever needs to die dies and that's just what it is and and we just have to accept and respect that the virus kind of comes through like is that because I've, I've heard that type of argument and i'm not necess- i don't know if that's the argument that you're making but you know the virus is here and it's causing it's causing harm you know on multiple levels I'm, and our reaction is causing harm so like well, is what is the response then is the response to yeah yeah, well, I'd like to just develop what I'm saying a little bit more, and I'll sure, come back sure. to that. And, right? and I apologize if I'm being reactive. No, no, it's like all anything, all it's 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 a, it's a sensitive issue, right? So no, yeah. it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Um, so so that was that'll be one example of of, of viral uh, viral code sure. um, altering um, our genetic history. Another one would be there's a particular um, vi- bit of viral code that separates humans off from from uh, other. Groups. Is another one. Um, there are various forks in our history where viruses have been very important. Um, and in fact, um, complex systems, things like, for example, the Calvin cycle in, uh, in plants, which is a whole load of different reactions, were, uh, which, which allows basically sunlight to be turned into sugars. There are a whole bunch of, and no one really can understand. Well, you can't explain that through normal evolution, but you can explain that through the incorporation of viral DNA, which has which has specialized in very because viral there's, there's you know untold millions and quintillions and of them, and they specialize in very in, in niches, right? So though they can they can become kind of uh, assemblies of, of viral DNA, make us what we are, right? So I, I, what I'm saying here is we have a very long. Uh, interaction and history with virus and with uh, infectious disease. And my, my personal connection with leishmaniasis, which was a disease, was a one of liberation, right? I am a different person now, having gone through that disease process, and I'm glad it happened, and it threatened my life, and I lost 10 kilos, and uh, I still have a scar, and it could have killed me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the question about whether it is, uh, you know, it's trying to do us over, right? I don't know if that is in the bag. I think we have been trying to do ourselves over for hundreds of years since at least the Industrial Revolution. Mm. I think it's very interesting and tragic that in Brazil, for example, Brazil's got 3% of the world's population, 30% of the COVID cases. Well, um, I can't remember if it's COVID cases or COVID deaths. I think it's COVID deaths. Right? Well, Brazil, Bolsonaro, is, Bolsonaro is still like, COVID's not a thing. Keep going, keep doing your life. Like he... Yeah, Bolsonaro is like a pimple on a on a monster which has been rampaging through Brazil yeah. for 500 years. Sorry right. for laughing. It's it, it, the metaphor, yeah. but it's serious. Yeah, yeah, he's a little bit like Trump in a way. You know, he's just a very obvious expression of uh, a disgusting system. Mm-hmm. But Obama, in terms of his body count, was uh, was way worse. You know, in terms of the number of drone attacks, new wars, right? So. Um, but my point is that Brazil, Brazil's treatment of its environment over the last, well, even, even recently, like the destruction of the Cerrado, for example, it's just, it's a biome in the center of Brazil. Um, the biggest medicine chest in the, in the world, the Cerrado, it's, it's like, it's called the Brazilian Savanna. It doesn't look like the uh, Amazon or the Atlantic forest. It's kind of twisty trees and a lot of rootstock, but an incredible amount of, uh, medicinal plants that come out of this. Uh, biome, right? Um, millions of square kilometers of that have been turned into soy farms mm-hmm. in the last uh, 10 years, right? Uh, under Lula, initially under Lula, Lula's um, did a lot for the people of Brazil, but he absolutely trashed the environment in Brazil. And for the indigenous people, he didn't secure any, any land rights either, um, although he's kind of considered something of a hero. Now, isn't that curious that the country which has destroyed more of its... Um, natural medicines than anywhere else in the world has ended up with the most, which the most, uh, unpleasant and awful, um, forms of COVID. And, and they're very, very serious. I've got friends whose, whose work colleagues have died in Brazil. You know, it's, 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 it's rampaging in Brazil. Um, I think it, I think the biome is intelligent. If I was the biome and I was looking at the planet, I would pinpoint what the problem is. And I would say, okay, well, the problem is, one of the problems is humans are working really, really hard, right? Humans are doing a whole load of stuff. They're doing far more than they should do. They, 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 they should do. Maybe I would send out something that makes them go to sleep, right? Maybe I would attack those who are overworked. One of the very interesting things for 
it's kind of first rushes, were where did it strike? It struck New York, for example. Massive, massive um, problem in New York. New York has the lowest sleeping hours uh, or the, the longest work hours in, the, in, in all of the US and are probably in, the, in, in all of the world, right? Isn't that curious? I remember this, there was one guy, there was this article in the paper in England about, um, it, was, uh, it was saying, um, yeah, COVID kills young people as well because there was a, a nightclub producer who was, uh, I think, in their 30s or something, who was killed by COVID. Dude, the guy's a nightclub producer. He's not clearly not going to sleep. You go all the way back to the Vedas, it says, if you don't sleep, you don't cure, right? So, And there's a whole other question about, particularly, again, since we've got screens and all that kind of thing, we don't have, as human beings, we don't have space for trance, right? We don't have, we, we, we're on it in front of screens until we go to sleep, right? Sometimes on sleeping pills or whatever we might be, right? We don't have whole hours where we, where we have this kind of um, space where the spirits can talk to us because we're calming down and we're chilling out and we're stopping doing stuff, right? You understand what I'm saying? I do understand space. what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And, I'm and incred- I'm, I have some level of incredulousness around, around how what you're saying might be adopted by other people who have maybe... I don't know, as, as I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I really don't know. Like I'm listening to you. I feel reactive. I also feel agreement. You know, I feel concern about sort of the impact of this episode in some places of thinking. I feel there's like, you know, I, I, I admit that this entire conversation, especially over the course of the COVID has really put me in a place where I admit, like, I feel very uncertain and, and also very aware of how of all the different reactions around my 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 uncertainty, um, and some of which I feel are valid, but I'm also have an awareness of whether or not that sense of validity is a sense of sort of like grasping at certainty, you know. So that's well, so. Let's go back to before COVID, there. right? Let's go back to before COVID, right? Yeah. For me, looking at the world before COVID, it was a bus driving towards a cliff uh, as fast as it could. Right, and we had some reaction to that. But Extinction Rebellion, for example, was uh, was one example of people trying to draw attention to that. For me, when COVID hit, I was like, "For you, right? Mm-hmm. For you, mm-hmm. at least there is something which has brought us together and started to, and, and just stopped that machine, or you know, could have, that. could have." Still. We don't know what happens with uh, COVID twenty COVID twenty one. You know, um, <laughs> who knows where it goes from here? We're getting all these virulent strains. I yeah. think because we have tried to stamp out something, right? And there's this other question, James, which is, um, is not whether we should respond to it with all the aggression we have, but whether responding to it with all the aggression that we have is going to make a difference anyway. And the idea that you can il- eradicate anything. I mean, dude. You, I can't. I can barely eradicate nits, head lice from my own family. Right? There's five of us. I've saved my head because the others have got, 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 all got afros. Right? You're trying to keep. You're trying to keep COVID out of a school. Try and get nits out of a school first. If the if the WHO could demonstrate, could eradicate nits in one village in England, then I would be prepared to listen to it uh, to say that it has some control over over something which is so small that it fit, goes through your mask. Right? Mm-hmm. You know. Um, so that, that's what I mean. It's, it's incredible arrogance. And, and I'm not saying on your part, but on the part of humanity to think that we have, that, that we have, uh, control over, over the biological world. Mm-hmm. And I mean that in the sense that we can control little micro, uh, micro organisms or and, and, and micro organisms, like little bits of, Sorry. Yeah, there was a lag there. And, 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 no, and I, I agree, okay. you know, and, and that, that same yeah. sort of like human superiority complex, the, the, it, the ideological, like narcissism behind that human superiority complex is also wrapped up in your, and, and from what I understand, your, you know, your criticisms of the, the authority of, of, of scientism within scientific academia. Exactly. So, yeah. um, there's, there's papers out which talk about how forests protect human populations from, um, uh, pathogens. Mm-hmm. But, and the reason that we get a lot of plants, the reason we get a lot of our medicines from plants is because those plants have been developing ways to protect themselves from attack, from right. bacteria and funguses and all that. Right. For, we're, learning their in, we're learning from their intelligence. Indeed. And yeah. also, um, yes, we, we are very, very slowly. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the point is they formed natural barriers between um, kind of moving around pathogens. 
right? You went out and you replace them with soy farms, you remove those natural barriers. So this is what mm-hmm. this is another level of thinking we can control the world. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna turn it all into soy to feed a, a meat addiction and um, and not expect consequences from that. So I mean, I, I would ask people to shift out of the human centric perspective, and that's very difficult. It's the same as asking. Um, Galileo asking the church to move the, the, the earth from the center of the, of the solar system and the center of the universe, uh, not the solar system, <laughs> to move to from the center of the universe. Um, and say, if you were the world and you'd seen 90, let's say 90, 93% of the Atlantic forest has been destroyed and the remainder is being destroyed at the rate of about between one to 3% a year and the Atlantic forest is the water pump which feeds the Amazon, right? And it's, it's, it's there's no hope of it stopping. Uh, what would you do if you were the planet? And I would, I think it's done, you know, if you look at it from a kind of animistic perspective, it could have been the plague, man. It could have been Black Death. It could have been a really nasty disease that takes your children away. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's a disease which takes away, and, I'm, and this is no, there's no moral judgment here, but it takes away sick people who are very old, right? Go back to Psalm 90. Three score years and 10. Four score years in great hardship, right? It says that in the Psalms. We're not meant to live until, if you live to 80, brilliant, good luck, absolutely fantastic. One of the things my mum said when she came through, she was really ill with COVID. She came through and um, her granddaughter, uh, who's just turned 17 the other day, she had to miss her exams, she had to miss her holiday. She said, we're sacrificing the young for the old. That was her perspective, right? Mm-hmm. And that kind of, and, and I think that kind of um, worship of these old ideas, you know, the American is a great example. You know, you had the oldest election ever. You had people in their late 70s uh, duking it out over who gets control of a country. Right? I, th- I think uh, there's, a, there's, there's a piece I want to drop in there that about how, you know, the loss of an older generation is, would be, well, I mean, a lot of, us don't have actual elders we just have olders that aren't really entirely competent to provide any type of wisdom anyways because the culture didn't help make them elders we didn't help make them elders or whatever we're elderless in many ways but you know sacrificing the old for like sacrificing the young for the old is one way but then like sacrificing the old for the young it's like i I think i just want to throw in there that there actually is quite a bit of value to try to keep our olders around and not just like let them let them die off. I mean, like again, I, I see the incredulous look on your face um, that I'm not necessarily sort of claiming that that's what you're saying, but I'm sort of like reading in between things and being like, hold on, I just want to push against the, that insinuation yeah, a little cool. bit. But it's not, yeah. us, it's not us letting them die off. It's the world. It's age. It's death, right? It's, it's death making them die off. Death kills people, right? And in fact, the fact that we put them in care homes rather than keeping them in, in our houses which is what back in the day people used to do. So they had dead people, you know, people were experienced with death because they'd all seen mm-hmm. grandpa die, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and it wasn't this terrifying thing. And now it's kind of flipped and everyone's familiar with sex from the age of like, as soon as they get on the internet, uh, but no one's ever seen death. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I, I, um, I agree with that. Yeah, very much. But, so. um, um, it's not us. It, it's not, like I say, 80, what is it, 81% of the, of, of the deaths are in care homes, right? Who brought the COVID into care homes? In England, the, the old people were, with COVID, were sent into care homes to infect the rest of them, right? So even though we might think we should look after old people, we're not competent looking after old people. Right? There's this question of triage, right? If we're going to drop the ball, or rather we're not going to be able to protect humans from the world, right? From, from, from the fact that the world is full of death and life and love and all kinds of other things, but at the moment we're on a bit of a death tip, um, then, uh, again, it's this kind of hubris of, of this attempted control, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think a really interesting example of, of this um, very strange relationship we have with death is that the Day of the Dead in Mexico was cancelled because of COVID. Hmm. Isn't that mm-hmm. curious? Yeah. You know, the Day of the Dead was cancelled because we worried about people dying. Um, seems, yeah. So I, I, I appreciate that it's a, a contentious and, and kind of difficult area. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important for us to think, I know what we would like to do. We'd like everyone to live forever. And wouldn't that be great? But then we've got to look at what we will do. And if the, if the response 
is, for example, keeping us in our houses so we don't actually get enough vitamin D to be able to deal with a disease that is 20 times more likely to kill you if you have low vitamin D levels. You know, it's it's that old story of, um, you know, if you're in the mud, you don't floor the pedal on your car. You know, if you're in the mud, you get out of the car and look at what's going wrong and try and find some bricks and try and get the try and get the car out of the mud. But just doing the same thing. What have we done? We've produced a massive amount of plastic, right? We had a problem with plastic. So how have we dealt with COVID? Let's produce a shitload of plastic, you know, mm. um, I don't think that's the answer. <laughs> I, don't think I, de- the I definitely, I, I see what you're saying and I, and I really agree, you know, like, uh, you know, COVID has been extremely damaging and our reaction to it seems to have created a shit ton of other damage uh, as well. I mean, even the idea that it might have slowed things down um, doesn't even feel like it's a possibility anymore. And like you said, like maybe, um, maybe we'll still be forced to come together on something and actually turn this bus around or something. But I'm, I'm personally not convinced. I'm also not convinced in sort of like the messianic promise of technology and the, and the, and the sort of con the con the conquest of tech tech industry over, over the system systems of the world in order to save us from climate change is going to be that I, I don't, I'm not convinced in that messianic promise either, but I mean, maybe I'm a, maybe a little bit less optimistic on that front. Um, no, I'm not. Um, I'm 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 not particularly optimistic myself. I think we have the solutions, uh, but I think it's quite interesting. What was it? What were you talking about? The liquefied liquefaction? What was it? Liquefying of reality. Liquefying reality. We've got the liquefying yeah, of yeah. We've got the liquefying of our physical reality. The ice caps are literally melting. Right. If yeah. if if humanity can't keep up with that by going a little bit liquid i think that then we're behind you know we are integrated we are integrated into the natural world it's the natural world is going mental it's that thing i mean i used to, I used to work in therapy um I used to be a therapist you know and treating people with depression and like the answer is of course you're depressed <laughs> look at the fucking world you know look out the window so mm-hmm. just kind of moving on from that i i i first started in getting interested into in ecotherapy and the first incarnation of the uh, reforestation organization i run was the idea of it was a place where so ecotherapy tends to take people to beautiful places. They, like, for example, they take um, veterans from uh, various um, foreign policy errors uh, and take them, to the, um, take them to the Grand Canyon. And people would look at the grandeur of the Grand Canyon and find that their own problems were diminished in this massive um, kind of natural wonder. Um, but I was quite interested in the idea of ecotherapy as, as, rest, as uh, regenerative, i.e. Re- generating an environment and regenerating yourself doing it you know so you could have a so this is the initial the initial idea behind rain was to work with addicts for example or depressed people in regenerating landscapes because in, in i was a hypnotherapist in, in hypnotherapy you're often looking for metaphors to speak to people in their own language about how they might get better now the world is very very sick i mean i i i, I think it's I think it's obvious. I think it's obvious that the world is very, very sick, whichever way you look at it, mm-hmm. right? Socially, mm-hmm. environmentally. Um, and w- in the word crisis is a, is a medical, uh, it comes from the, comes from medicine. Crisis is the, is the moment at which a sickness either recovers or kills you. Right. And we're at a crisis point at the moment. And the, in, in, in medicine crisis involves fever, it involves, um, you know, convulsions. It involves all kinds of things as your organism responds, right? So I think this, um, you know, and I'm very fond of Eric, um, but I don't agree with him here. This idea of trying to keep it all together, trying to keep sensible where the world is not sensible is, um, again, um, it's, it's hubristic, you know. Um, I think we're entering a period of madness, a period of creative. I think we're in a period of madness. Actually, I met a guy on the train the other day. It was fascinating. The dude on the train with bare feet, and um, I got talking to him. There's a dude on the train with bare feet. Um, and we got chatting away. And what did he say? He said, the idea that you would, the kind of government that would um, introduce measures which destroys social contact is, by definition, sociopathic, right? That is sociopaths. The idea that would keep, I don't know, keep children away from their parents or scare children to thinking that they're going to kill granny by going to visit her, you know, uh, have having people die on their own in hospital and then not be mourned properly because their funerals. I went to, I had to do a funeral the other day. A friend of mine died and his daughter asked me to do a funeral. 
and they um the uh they called me up the funeral parlor called me up what kind of service are you doing i said oh we're gonna be singing songs oh no no you can't sing songs what are you talking about uh, no no you can't sing songs because of covid regulations i said i'm going to bring a case against you uh against the uh, for breach of the equalities act for uh, not allowing the free expression of religion. They said, oh, okay, you can sing your songs, right? There's all kinds of funerals going on where people can't sing their songs and express themselves, right? Imagine if you believe in ghosts, and I definitely believe in ghosts. I don't believe in them. I know them. Um, imagine all the ghosts that are being released by people dying on their own and not being mourned at funerals, right? So if we focus on this tiny thing, which is a little bit of, a little bit of code, which hasn't even been isolated yet, and one disease... You know, dude, Bill Gates, if you want to, if you want to deal with disease, uh, work with nutrition, man, like measles, uh, outcomes, polio outcomes, um, all, all outcomes are improved by, uh, by, um, uh, by nutrition. Yeah. So why don't we have a massive drive towards bringing nutrition to the world? No, let's, let's bring four different vaccines made by serial felons to uh to the world you know kind of companies that have repeatedly lied about what's in their <laughs> what's in their medicines uh off label you know um i've got an article by if people are interested in my more coherent thoughts about covid <laughs> and then came the virus is out on medium so uh yeah check that one out yeah. and one of those things i'm looking at the 11 companies that were making uh that were making vaccines and looking at their looking at their histories and it's shocking like they've all been no they haven't all uh, most of them have been um, prosecuted under false claims act some of them prosecuted every year for 10 years um when we're talking pfizer moderna um and all the rest and some of them are like uh, was it no vax hasn't produced anything like uh, they got a massive vax. i think it was no vax um they haven't produced a, a pharmaceutical in, in in their entire career you know hmm. um it's very very it's very 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 sketchy indeed but i'll, I'll pass on some uh, some links for your show notes james great um you had another article that i i i don't know if it was and then came the virus but you had the whole one about the nematode that i read uh earlier earlier on in the pandemic which i thought was really really brilliant um and nice sort of like maybe a little sort of like beacon of of coherency in the midst of at that time what felt like a lot of chaos and even still feels like a lot of chaos even this conversation you know feels like a lot of chaos and a lot of it being you know very much my sort of like reactions to uh my interpretations to portions of what you're saying <laughs> mixed in with like areas in which i agree and then there's there's a lot there so this has been an interesting conversation to say the least not only in its content but how what it asked of me and what it brought up from me and i appreciate that and i hope that uh listeners you know li listeners receive something similar and uh, go on to question and wonder about the complexity of the thing. Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully people come out feeling like they know less. That's part of me. I'm like, I feel like I'm coming out of this conversation feeling like I know less and that's good. Um, yeah. And that's what the original idea of science was to do, you know, it was to take away authority from um, authorities, which had been telling, you know, it comes out of this tradition of Aristotelian, um, kind of academic well it doesn't come it's a reaction actually against the uh kind of academic authorities that go back all the way to aristotle and said the world is like this and for example women have less teeth than men well dude count your daughter's teeth women don't have less teeth than men how did you, how did you believe that for century? um so yeah if, if that's the reaction you know i i don't know uh, but the buddha talks about this the buddha said the best way of you know no taste no mind no opinion you know so the, the best opinion to have is no opinion. But on the way to that is detachment. That's why Buddha talks about being detached from you know, detachment as a, 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 as a, as a practice. Certainly, so, a, yeah. certainly a difficult practice uh, in the midst of the COVID pandemic um, and the sort of the informational space that we're all conducting ourselves in, regardless of where we are and how we're making sense of it. Um, it's a complex and difficult terrain for us to be navigating as, uh, as humans that would, as species that would much prefer, I think, generally a coherent and predictable, this is what's what, uh, understanding of, of the, of the sort of a, a, a life, a life. And we'd also like to get back you know, outside and start licking each other again, you know? 
Yeah. I mean, I miss licking eyeballs. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, But yeah, I mean, here in Canada, there isn't there. Oh, man, let's not even get on that. But there's a lot of people being outside. (laughs) There's there's encouragement to be outside, just not to be close to each other, which uh, anyways, um, all that to be said, uh, Danny, before we go, I know you spoke about rain. You spoke about sort of like, um, you know, ecotherapy. You, You spoke about like the value of sort of, you know, having wild habitat, wild ecological sort of spaces for humans to be within and a part of, and you are a part of a, a program, a um, organization working with, uh, if I know correctly, uh, working with planting trees and helping to rehabilitate um, ecologies. Did you want to say a little bit more about that before uh, we close off? Yeah. So thank you. Um, when I don't, when I don't, when I'm not explaining uh, and, um, morbid theories about disease i run an organization it's called rain that stands for regenerative agroforestry impact network and we work with um reforestation as you said uh with agroforestry we're doing agroforestry in brazil we are working with two different indigenous nations um just released the other day a song produced by the nokikoe indigenous nation from the amazon um trying to develop a uh, project with the um with the kangang kangang are fascinating uh, group who have a particularly close association with the Paraná pine, the Araucaria angustifolia, um, and they plant it. Uh, have been planting it for about a thousand years, um, and it, it's a it's a bio, it draws in biodiversity because it has lots of um, uh, lots of pine nuts basically, so it attracts birds. And this this incredible um, culture has selected strains over the last well over many centuries that give fruit at different times of the year it was in animals all, about half of the year these different these different pines and that's very good for them for hunting but it's also very good for um ecosystem restoration which is the word of the decade since the uh, un made it the decade of ecosystem restoration but what we do is we partner with indigenous nations we partner partnering with um a black community uh in or rather a black women's group in the favela in hesifi um there we supported um group called um Heji Pela Transit Sound, that means a network for tra- transition, to produce agroecology, well first educational materials and then um a demonstration center in this black women's um center. And that's gone into one favela, it's now gone into nine favelas. And that's everything from collecting water off your roof to planting medicinal plants to uh composting and all that kind of stuff. Um we've got a really nice project called Trees of Music. Uh look that one up. It's um it's uh, about the Pernambuco trees. The Pernambuco tree is used to make violins, uh, violin bows, bows, and has been since about the 1720s. Um, and basically all the violin bows and uh, cello bows and bass bows and, uh, are made out of this, unless they're made out of carbon fiber, they're made out of uh, Pernambuco tree. And the Pernambuco tree is f- extremely endangered. At one of the last surveys, um, they found, I think, 1,500 standing or less than 1,500 standing in an area of historical density. So we partnered with an ecologist and bow maker by the name of Marco Haposo, and he's planting uh, 50,000 Pernambuco trees. And he came to us with this plan. I said, that's a great idea. Why don't we plant half of them in, uh, in degraded springs in the Atlantic forest? So we're reforesting springs to work with the hydrology, get the hydrology moving again. So it's 150 springs are being reforested with this project. And then we've got further projects further up the coast, which are also working with musical uh, woods that are used to make musical instruments, for example, rosewood, which is also in danger. Mm. Woods are in danger. But the media side of this is very exciting because we've got um, 29 classical musicians, including um, you know from orchestras uh, around the world, and uh, Victoria Malova, who's a considered one of the top 20 uh, violinist of all time uh came on and we produced a, a piece of music which was a chiquinho gonzaga tune um uh with with all these musicians coming together in support of the Pernambuco tree so please check out trees and music check out rain um which is rainumbrella.org and i want to say something actually the model that we're using for this um ngo is is a new model, or rather it's an old model. It's the mycorrhizal root network, which we were talking about before, which is, uh, were we talking about before? Was that we weren't talking about mycorrhizal root okay. network, but um, if you're talking about actually mycorrhizal root network um, as like a thing that exists in a forest, I've been reading um, uh, Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life and going deep into that recently, and it's 
Ah, cool. Fucking amazing. Such interesting stuff. Yeah. 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 Super cool. Um, so, so the, so the, there's a, there's basically a, a network of trees, uh, or a network of fungi that, that connect trees together and pass, uh, nutrients between them and also pass information between them. So this is a model we're taking. We don't have any projects as rain, but what we do do is we find ways of communicating between projects on the front line, facing desertification, facing food insecurity, uh, facing horrible forms of COVID and, um, all the rest and facing a fascist government mm -hmm. and find ways of putting them in touch with schools in the UK, like school partnerships, for example, uh, putting them in touch with businesses in not just in the UK, any businesses. We just signed a contract with one business, which is now, um, well, oh, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, we are the, uh, we are, we are building a network which allows direct, uh, mutual aid in a Kropotkin style, um, way of working, which is uh, decolonial and, um, not trying to impose anything. So we take projects that are already running and we amplify them. So mm -hmm. please check it out. And I want to say, and actually that mycorrhizal root network thing, when a, if an insect attacks a tree, yeah, the tree produces what's called infochemicals. It, will, it might produce lignin or it might produce uh, some kind of um, poison for the insect, but it will also produce infochemicals which are passed either through the air or through the mycorrhizal root network to other trees, right? So these are called infochemicals. And in our rain cosmology, uh, the infochemicals are media. So we're working out what kind of media transmits well to other trees on the network and also stimulates a response because in the mycorrhizal root network, the tree which receives this infochemical, it starts to produce those uh, responses to that threat, even though it's not being attacked. And that's not just the same species. In fact, other species are affected by those infochemicals. So what kind of media we produce, or not even produce, can we commission and pass through the network to get people to give a shit about what's happening at the edge of empire, which is uh, a permanent catastrophe um, mm -hmm. and has been for you know, many generations at this point. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thanks for that, Danny. If you want to just uh, give those two URLs uh, again, you or well, the, yeah. the relevant ones again. Yeah. So one is rainumbrella.org and another one is um, treesofmusic.org. Yeah. Great. And, and you can make... also find us on the, on the Shakruna website. Shakruna has just released the Indigenous Reciprocity Initiative and we are one of the organizations that's working with Sukuna with that as well. Great. Uh, so thanks for that, Danny. I'll make sure those links are contained in the show notes to this episode. And thanks for the uh, fast, complex, challenging, interesting, uh, and uh, ultimately kind of fun conversation today. <laughs> thanks very much, James. I really appreciate it. And cut. All right, so that's it. this episode of Adventures to the Mind. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Again, take everything that you just heard with a grain of salt. Do the appropriate check-ins. It's been several months since this conversation. A lot of things are changing very quickly in our world, which Stephen Jenkinson, uh, when he talked about his time in the death trade, he mentioned that you never really know when a person's going to die. Um, but uh, he did say that you can predict with fairly reliable certainty based on the changes in significant symptoms or significant changes in the health, which is that if somebody's having significant changes monthly, then they've got months to live daily, days to live hourly, hours to live, etc. And uh, the rates of change in our society are ramping up quickly. So keep that in mind. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, do the appropriate references before doubling down with allegiancing to any one side or another of the discussion that you heard Danny and I have today. And if you're interested in his reforestation project, Rain, I highly recommend checking it out and throwing your support in that direction because it's a beautiful project. And that's all. So before I go, I'm gonna show you a little bit about where I am here. So pardon the shakiness of the camera. All right, standing up. This is a trail behind me. I'm in the moose capital of the world. I did see one moose. A small one, nothing too large. But I'll also walk you down here to the harbor. Maybe not the whole walk. Do a little crossfade here. Nice look at Newfoundland Canada. Try not to get a bike card here.
Okay, so that's all. Thanks for tuning in, and I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care. <laughs>